Welcome to HGC's annual Landmarks Lion Award. Tonight, we're going to be celebrating 50 years of the Historic Districts Council. Thank you for joining us, and let's get on to the show. We'd like to give special thanks to all of our supporters and members of the Benefit Committee. This event would not be the success it is without your great support. Thank you so much. Hi there, welcome to the HDC Landmarks Lion Award for 2020. My name is Greg Young. And I'm Tom Myers, and we are the hosts of the Bowery Boys New York City History Podcast. It is our honor to be your virtual hosts or MCs this evening for today's Landmark Lions Awards. It's also an honor because this year's special. It is the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Historic Districts Council. For Almost 14 years, Tom and I have produced podcasts relating to New York City history. Of course, many subjects which cross into the objectives and purposes of the Historic Districts Council. Yes, in fact, earlier this year, we even did a show about landmarking. We are here, thrilled to be on the stage of the famous Bell House in Gowanus, Brooklyn. But Greg, we're not alone, because we are sitting on a stage being looked at by a live studio audience. What was to become of a city like New York that was packed with tight streets and historic structures? Well, fortunately, there were people here in New York who thought that those places were worth fighting for. And one of their first major achievements, of course, was the passage of the 1965 Landmarks Law. When one thinks of everything the Historic Districts Council does, it's, it's hard to imagine such a small, challenged group could have accomplished so much and, and still continues to do so much, from our Six to Celebrate program to all of our public education, to our advocacy work um, around the city with public officials and particularly at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Originally, HDC was founded as a committee as part of the Municipal Art Society, created in the 1890s to grant New York City with beautiful public art. Among HDC's earliest activities was to lobby for support for the brand new nascent Landmarks Preservation Commission. The commission was formed in 1965, and back then they were very underfunded and unsupported. The Historic Districts Council was created to get politicians involved and to get additional support for the agency. And also to show that there were real people who were involved and concerned about this movement. Well, after some successes in the early 1970s, the HDC went inactive until 1978, when Kent Barwick left the Municipal Art Society and became the head of the Landmarks Commission. Once there, he realized that it might be useful to have an organization representing the collective voices of all of the different historic districts. And so he asked Joe Rosenberg, an activist from Brooklyn Heights, to revive the old committee. I got to know Kent because I was living in Brooklyn Heights and was chair of the Brooklyn Heights Association Landmarks Preservation Committee. And at that time, Con Edison was planning to demolish the Empire Stores in what was called Fulton Ferry in order to build a electric generating plant along the East River. Now at that time, there was no one living in Fulton Ferry so the residents up the hill in Brooklyn Heights were the only ones who could work to get the area designated an historic district in order to stop Con Ed from demolishing the Empire stores. So we were working with Kent and the Landmarks Preservation Commission on that project. And Kent asked me if I would reactivate the Historic Districts Council under the auspices of the Municipal Art Society. 
We did it. The Municipal Art Society supplied the staff and the funds. I was very impressed with Kent because he was chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and he wanted to reactivate an organization that could very well and did become a thorn in his side. Now, while Tony was president, the Historic Districts Council decided to become independent, uh, breaking away from the Municipal Art Society, and that was a very big decision. As many of you know, HDC was a committee of the Municipal Art Society. It started to find its own voice, get its sea legs, begin to become a rather strong and ardent voice for preservation. And at some times it took positions that were even more, shall we say, progressive preservation positions and more strident preservation positions than the Municipal Arts Society itself. Now this didn't bother Kent Barwick who ran the Municipal Arts Society at that time because he appreciated the dynamic of having an organization that was further out there helping move center left when it came to final decisions being made. So he appreciated the good cop, bad cop dimension that we could play. However, he and I both realized that this depended largely on our relationship and that we weren't both gonna be in those roles forever. So we decided it made sense for HCC to finally go out on its own as an independent organization, which it did. Shortly after that, there was meetings. Joe was coming to them for a little while and the effort was to find a space. And then Landmark West said, share our basement, which was very helpful. Leaving its cozy quarters in the garden flat apartment Landmark West office, it moved above ground to the second floor of the Neighborhood Preservation Center. Uh, and there it had the ability to be much more public, convene more, meet more with people and really get, I think, another level of visibility and effectiveness. And that's how we started. My first job in preservation was at the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And the first assignment I had from the boss, Blair Lori Beckelman, was to go to a gathering of folks to talk about charter revision. A bunch of preservationists from neighborhoods all around the city had gathered to learn what they could about the process, the hearings, and the challenges. A guy named Tony Woods stood up, I remember, and he was full of worry about what charter re revision could hold for the city and for preservation in particular. And um, I was sent home back to the Lemmers Conservancy with a list of people who were on this thing called the Historic Districts Council Board. Uh, I don't think I'd ever heard of them either, but I started going through the list and calling everyone to bring them out to the hearings so that preservation would have an ear and a voice at every hearing in every borough. Franny uh, left the conservancy and said, I will be the executive director and I will have to raise my own salary. So when the district's council agency started to talk about professionalizing with a a executive director and grow grow from the position of a, a, a committee, which is how it started, I thought I would take on the challenge. I followed Eric Allison and Tony Wood as HDC's third president in 2000. One of our first jobs was to hire a new executive director and the search committee I put together found Simeon Bankoff, who's now famous as the voice of HDC. We quickly formed an administration committee so that our talented board members might have a greater voice in decision making. HEC has grown enormously since I first came to know it on 67th Street, and now it um, is a citywide advocate of some renown. An accomplishment was rebranding HDC through the gifts of Roger Byram, whose company Addison gave us a forceful new public persona. It's been wonderful to see HDC grow over these past 50 years. I think, however, HDC is going to be called to play an even greater and even more important role going forward in the next 50 years. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, this is a really special time for HDC. Uh, it's in addition to our 50th anniversary. Um, it's also actually my 20th anniversary as the executive director, so I'm really pleased to be sharing it this evening with you. So I thought that what would be good to do would be to have a little drink and celebration. Now, ordinarily at HDC's Lions, uh, we have the cocktails beforehand, but now we're gonna have the cocktails during it. 
this is a special occasion. I'm gonna be making a Negroni. Forgive my hands, you should be using ice tongs, but frankly, who's that coordinated? A Negroni is um, a gin-based cocktail. I was thinking about making a Manhattan because that would be a little bit more on brand, but I've been reading Bernard DeVoto's The Hour and he claims that whiskey and vermouth cannot meet and part friends. So, in deference to him, we're making an Italian-style Negroni, which is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one part. So it's one part gin as your base spirit, one ounce of Campari. Campari is an Italian digestif. It is a uh, slightly bitter liqueur, but does wonderfully for Americanos and for um, Negronis also. Uh, works very well in mimosas. This is sweet vermouth. You wish to use sweet vermouth, not try vermouth for it. There is a persistent rumor in this world that you shouldn't shake gin because you bruise it. Frankly, you, you, you don't have to worry about that. Gin is much tougher than you and I. Now, we're also pouring it into the classic Historic Districts Council wine glass, well known for many of our events, like the Grassroots event or our board meetings. These glasses were actually bought by Franny Everhart when she was executive director back in the early 90s for an early Landmarks Lion. They've, they've come with us for the last 27 years and they will continue moving forward, so. Here's to that. And here you have it, a Negroni. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. New York wouldn't be New York without you. Cheers. The hearings for the Landmarks Preservation Commission were fairly informal. And as I remember it, they were held in some of the most ornate rooms within City Hall. And at that time, City Hall had very little security. There was no single spokesperson at that time for the Historic Districts Council. Generally speaking, Ed Kirkland and Jack Taylor went down to testify. I joined public review. I thought it would be a useful um, thing to do. Uh, and I think that's really an understatement. Public review, uh, while it sounds banal, is in fact, uh, can in fact be very exciting at times. It's a group of uh, dedicated people who meet pretty much every week uh, now uh, to review everything that comes before the Landmarks Preservation Commission. It's important, I think, that the public has a, a role in what gets designated and how, once something is designated, it's treated. Uh, we've done a great deal at Public Review over the years, and it's one of the very satisfying things about being involved with the group is that as you walk around New York City, you can see tangible effect uh, of what we've done, what we've uh, advocated for, and in some cases, what we've advocated against. There are some really terrible ideas uh, that have been floated over the years, and we've helped uh, through strenuous argument to prevent some of those. Uh, I think most recently, we were shown uh, a terrible uh, proposal uh, to change the copper roof of the uh, Bush Tower on 42nd Street, the great Helmley and Corbett early skyscraper, uh, to a, a fake roof, a plastic roof that was painted to look like copper. We didn't understand the motivation of it, of it other than maybe just cheapness and, and pure greed. Um, and we fought very strongly, we advocated very strongly that this important building deserved real materials, real craftsmanship, and a real roof. And I, uh, the commission agreed with us uh, and sent them packing. We would meet on Friday mornings, the Friday before the commission hearings, at the public hearing rooms of the Landmarks Commission, and we would look at very large, oversized, cumbersome uh, foam core drawings uh, for the projects. Sometimes it seemed like I was hurting cats because it was a group of very, very smart, very opinionated, and sometimes very critical uh, people who were part of the committee, um, people like Terry Slater, Christabel Goff, Jack Taylor, Christopher London. I uh, was the co-chair of the Public Review Committee for many, many years with two um, very special and lovely friends, Jack Taylor and Terry Slater, amongst others, who helped us uh, deliver a review of all the items that came up before the Landmarks Preservation Commission and give lively testimony uh, conveying our point of view. The Historic Districts Council really played a key role um, 
for those districts that don't have their own advocacy groups. So while neighborhoods like Greenwich Village, Upper East and Upper West Sides, and Brooklyn Heights had their own staffed organizations, most districts did not. So our dedicated public review committee, which I manage every Friday, we look at all applications in all boroughs. And the reason that's important is because not every neighborhood is fortunate or privileged enough to have a preservation staff. So we're often the only ones advocating for neighborhoods who don't have a preservation staff, like this one in Bay Ridge. I would usually spend most of my day at the Landmarks Commission public hearings um, and would um, read the commentary for, um, uh, for the Historic Districts Council on projects. And I think there are many times that, you know, the, the comments of the Historic Districts Council made made a difference in terms of what the commission ended up deciding. The Public Review Committee looks at all the applications to landmark buildings and buildings in historic districts that come to public review before the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I thought that having a say in, those, in whether those applications are appropriate was an important function of preservation, so I wanted to participate in it. I still think so, and I'm still on that committee. There's no question that the C of A program, which is a program that board members have dedicated themselves to, to um, be at the Landmarks Commission, to see what kind of changes are being approved or accepted, to weigh in on them. It has been a phenomenal um, kind of contribution to preservation. And I think we know that the Landmarks Commission has very often appreciated the feedback from HDC. Not always, but the vast majority of the time, I think we've done a, a wonderful job. The HDC Boundaries Project, an initiative that compared community-based historic district boundaries to those ultimately designated by LPC. We of course found that the commission repeatedly took the approach that less was more, but our approach was that under designation served no one, least of all the communities who had worked so hard to get historic designation to protect their neighborhoods. And LPC was very enthusiastic about the landmarking of the neighborhood um, and held their own meeting or meetings. Uh, I think they were really excited that this was a neighborhood that was outside of Manhattan, uh, that had a really rich cultural history, really, you know, a unique history and strong community support. Historic Districts Council was able to provide a voice um, and to provide a advocacy role for, for those people and for those projects. Tom, who knew that dealing with changes to historic buildings was so complicated? They knew. I think everybody watching this knows that it's pretty complicated. Going before the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, to make a change to an existing landmark building is pretty late in the whole landmarking process. So how did we even get here? How do you even get to that part of the process? What comes before it? In the time that I been involved with HDC, I've lived in three of the five boroughs and wherever I lived, I always saw uh, HDC really on the ground, empowering and inspiring people to take an active role in preserving and standing up for their community and the historic resources that uh, give it character and are important to them. And I think they are especially strong in doing that. After designation, um, we faced uh, other challenges that we hadn't expected. We thought, well, we're designated, we're safe, but we were not. Um, the city uh, city planning um, and a private developer came forward with two Euler applications and again the Historic Districts Council helped us with an amazing campaign that we were supported by David McCulloch, Ken Burns, the communities of Fulton Ferry Landing, Vinegar Hill as well as our own. It was real eye-opener to me to know that there were all these people in all of these neighborhoods all over the city who cared so deeply and would step up to the plate. HTC became involved with Addisley Park uh, when Greg Mays and Addis, other Addisley Park Civic Association or Civic Organization members reached out to HTC and asked us about the possibility of preserving Addisley Park through landmarking. Uh, they were concerned about a major proposal 
to demolish the Veterans Hospital on the edge of Addisley Park. And this also raised the discussion of preserving Addisley Park itself. Thanks to HTC, the group I co-founded in 2004 continued to campaign for the designation of additional historic buildings in North Brooklyn, including the Domino Sugar Factory and the Eberhard Faber Pencil Factories in Greenpoint and many others. So Eastmead Town is a really interesting case because Mayor Bloomberg uh, wanted to rezone Eastmead Town and uh, this sort of came, if I remember correctly, rather suddenly. Um, and although we, you know, had an idea of, of the buildings we wanted protected in that area, I don't think we'd been quite as deliberate as we could have been. And so when this, this sort of thunderbolt fell, we organized a uh, task force, uh, the East Midtown Task Force, I think, Jack Taylor was in there, Penelope Barrow was in there, uh, uh, a number of other people, and we said let's just mobilize and, and see what we can do. The Civic Association was and is incredibly active, and many times I think this is really what, you know, really moves preservation forward in neighborhoods when the Civic Association or local, the local community is incredibly involved. Um, that's, I think, where you see the most success. Hello! On one of the murals of the Empire State Dairy Buildings, which was landmarked in 2017, and I'm here today to congratulate the Historic District Council 50 year anniversary. Woo! Or should I say, woo! In 2015, when I started preserving East New York, it was a little bit overwhelming as we did not know how to navigate the landmarks process. When in 2016, HDC, which we call our Landmarks Fairy Godmother, when they took us under their wings, it was such great relief because there is nothing that compares to having the support and guidance of the Historic District Council. DOT was planning to do the reconstruction of our streets and we were devastated by the utility companies just coming in and digging up and not putting anything back in kind. After 2014, um, on a walking tour organized by Council Member Levin, um, the Historic Districts Council, Andrew Dolcart, I mean, countless times these, after designation, they have helped us out. Uh, we applied for support to survey the neighborhood and hire consultants to research both the physical place, including the architecture and the incredible cultural history, including um, the discrimination people face through racial covenants, um, and later the wide range of famous black cultural icons who made Addisley Park their home. I also worked with Maxine Gordon, who is a jazz historian who focused on the cultural history of the neighborhood, um, including the large number of jazz musicians who lived there in the 1950s and 60s. Um, she interviewed local residents, including Clarence Irving, who was, who was a longtime resident and unofficial historian of the neighborhood. We walked the area meticulously, um, not too fast because Jack, Jack was with, with us, um, and we made a list of the buildings that we thought were worth considering for landmarking. And we made a list of buildings and we assigned each other a number of buildings to, to study a bit and to write essentially a small designation report, a, a one-pager about why that building merited designation. And we sort of went back and forth and we had a pretty comprehensive list of buildings. And then we thought it would be good to collaborate with the other preservation organization. And we organized a meeting with Peg Breen of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And then after some negotiation and some discussion, we agreed that we would write a single letter to the Landmarks Preservation Commission asking them to uh, look at this area carefully and to consider a number of buildings for designation. And then I think we individually, each organization submitted its list of uh, buildings, which was pretty much, which overlapped in mostly, but there were some, some slight differences. And, and we submitted these lists to the Landmarks Position Commission with the, with the, the support of the three organizations. Another area that I think is really important is um, the six to celebrate. Now that we're spending more time at home and in our neighborhoods and boroughs, it's essential that we protect what's around us. 
We're the organization that has provided over 40 neighborhood guides to the city and has virtual tours coming directly to you. The fact that we've now been able to sort of help give a leg up to groups that are trying desperately to figure out how to protect their communities. And it's, that's a, a vital role as well and a role that no one else is involved with. My story in terms of preservation is very simple. Uh, I got into historic preservation about five years ago uh, due to all of the development that was going on in the neighborhood of Mott Haven. It's great to participate. This is the 25th uh, anniversary. Mott Haven was chosen as one of the six to celebrate. And when that happened, it brought tremendous attention to the cost of preservation in the South Bronx. Well, as chair of the designation committee, as you know, we did, uh, this was under Leo Blackman, who was then president, we invented uh, the six to celebrate, and I have to give credit to the members of this committee. There was Penelope Barrow, there was uh, Ed Kirkland, I think, there was um, Anis Ald. And what was interesting is that the staff person who was assigned our committee was, was Nadeja Williams. And she kept pushing. She said, you know, what's your mission? What's the designation committee's mission? What is it you want to do? because HDC does, you know, push designation. So what is it this committee is doing? And so we thought that we could be proactive since our strength is really the neighborhoods themselves, you know, and, and, and the advocacy in the neighborhoods themselves. I thought that instead of individually HDC itself going after designation, I thought that we could call upon these neighborhoods to come to us and say, this is the effort that we're trying to, to engage in. This is what we try to accomplish, and that we would help them. You can begin to see a few more residential buildings, and it's really a motley mix of different types. But tide mills were some of the very earliest forms of industry and commerce. Welcome to 47th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue. And this block is very unique because it has your basic brownstones across the way, done in the early 1900s. And the six comes because we didn't want five because then we'd have to have one per borough, so we were strategic about that. And then there was a nice alliteration, the six to celebrate. So, so, this, was, so this was started, as it has proven to be really successful. And, and I think we've accomplished a lot with this program. And I think that just the fact of a little neighborhood group, whether it's two people in a kitchen or 10 people or 100 people coming together and having to say in a coherent way, this is what we're trying to do. Having to formulate a kind of a mission statement and having to take some photographs of what it is they want to protect, they're already on their way. This is to um, go on and support for our campaign. Okay. That is um, support East 20th District proposed historic district. So uh -huh. we're hoping that the landmarks will make us a historic district. Wow, that sounds like a lot of work. Do they ever have time for fun? I kind of understand now why Simeon's been making cocktails this whole time. Where's our cocktail? <laughs> One of the ways um, to bring people together and to build a community is to actually host events and kind of get people all on the same page and involved. In fact, we were actually honored right here at uh, St. Mark's Church with a Grassroots Preservation Award back in 2018. Right outside that window in the churchyard. Hmm. Wistful. thing that is constant in New York City is change. New York is, and always has been, in a state of perpetual transformation. And I wouldn't have it any other way. But as our city changes, rising to meet each new challenge that we face, we have a responsibility to make sure that the history of our great city survives. I always believe very strongly that those of us who are practitioners and those of us who study the material science also should understand the why, um, the social reasons, the cultural reasons, the historic reasons why something works, doesn't work, why something's popular, why something comes into fashion, goes out of fashion. And terracotta is really a wonderful example of that.
the preservation field is moving more and more towards recognizing sites of cultural significance and not just great works of architecture. We've been able to um, build these relationships with which really has been the key to our survival. We wouldn't been, have been able to last this long without making friends and developing that kind of um, relationship with um, the people in our communities. It is absolutely shocking what happens when you don't have people fighting. So you need people there fighting and 50 years of people fighting is a good thing. I can't wait to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Historic Districts Council as we uh, fight for preservation for the past 50 years, the next 50 years, and hopefully eternity. We also honored, of course, landmark lions, among them the very talented Joyce Matz, and the gifted counsel of the Landmarks Commission, Dorothy Minor, whose successful legal strategy won New York the Supreme Court ruling upholding the Landmarks Law. I'm always being asked, what is the place in New York that I love the most? And people think, oh my goodness, what are all the buildings I, I go through in the neighborhoods? I, what am I going to come up with? The place in New York that I treasure, that's like asking which of your children do you love most? My favorite New York City landmark is Gracie Mansion. It's a wonderful late 18th century home. Uh, it is living history. I have always been astonished and delighted by Times Square. I think it's an absolutely extraordinary uh, achievement because it's so American, because it's for everybody. The uh, single place that I treasure most is my house, 157 Willow Street. Landmark buildings and landmark spaces offer us perspective, a sense of identity. They shape our experience and most of all, provide us with an awareness that some things last longer than mortal existence. 89.90, we were cut 42%. And the recession happened and all those new programs went out of business. Boom, done. Mrs. Hart never considered doing that. It was always such an important part of our mission, a feather in our cap. It's architecture for God's sake. HDC really encourages people to engage in the process and they give them the tools to do it from incredible preservation training programs uh, to just really being a community of preservation minded people where if someone uh, doesn't really know where to start or has a question on kind of how to uh, move past a roadblock, HDC has such an amazing network of not only professionals but just fellow community advocates who are eager to share what they've learned and help others achieve the same kind of goals that they once had. very happy to have a new and very forceful editorial group in charge of District Lines, our HDC newsletter. And Tony Robbins, Penelope Barrow, the great and gifted Jack Taylor were among those who helped make District Lines an influential and well-read newsletter that people enjoyed. I had a background in journalism. So when a request for volunteers was made to revive District Lines, the newsletter of HTC started in the 1980s. I raised my hand and the job was mine. That was in 2002 and for the next five years, I was the editor of a 12-page publication that came out three times a year. With the help of the late beloved Jack Taylor, we covered subjects of general preservation interest, such as demolition by neglect, preservation facade easements, rezoning, and the rape of PS64, along with the activities of HDC. Sometimes though, when you're trying to protect a historic building, things can go a little wrong. The city won't listen to you. Real estate people have their own plans. Uh, city officials won't call you back. And sometimes you can't even get the attention of the media. 
So what do you do then? Well, what has HTC done then? I would say the things I'm most proud about are the early historic districts that we designated with a lot of opposition. Everyone feels a sense of history and distinct sense of place on every single corner in Greenwich Village. That feeling, that sense of history and of place is what preservation is all about. Yes. It's what people like us fight for when we say we are preservationists. Because, uh, make no mistake, we love Greenwich Village and we can't imagine our city without it, but we needed to fight to preserve it, to have this wonderful neighborhood. And those districts are more than just buildings to be protected from demolition. They are the character and the spirit of our city which is why we have to keep fighting to preserve the places that make New York City special. We live, as you all know, in an unparalleled time of real estate speculation, and we cannot just celebrate the successes of historic districts that we fought so hard to create. We must keep fighting and keep pushing for these designations across all five boroughs, not just in Manhattan, but across all five boroughs. The dean of the NYU Law School, John Sexton, who strangely insisted on starting every meeting by hugging us, had been in charge of pushing through a new law school tower that, among other things, would have destroyed Edgar Allan Poe's home and the important Judson houses, removing the important and historic view of the Judson Church Campanile Tower. In New York City, a lot of our economy is based around real estate, building new real estate, and as a result, we see our past getting forgotten, and anyone who lives in these old buildings that are part of this past being pushed out of our city. They're the ones who are going to preserve the affordable housing in our city that we need, because otherwise the city's just going to become a place for uh, millionaires, and now that they're building housing for them, billionaires. And the rest of us need a place to live to. Together with a few other tenants of the building and preservation advocates, uh, we uh, launched a secret landmarking campaign from within the building. And from the beginning, HDC was a strong supporter of the designation and was so helpful to me, to my group, in learning about the landmarks process, um, just educating us on the procedures, and we learned a lot about politics. Uh, through the process as well. They were immensely helpful in so many ways, offering insightful guidance into, in terms of strategy and making practical suggestions too uh, for steps we should be taking. They gave me the idea of creating a postcard campaign to show the public support of the designation of the building. Um, these ones, which were sent to Landmarks, and LPC received over 500 of these in support of designation in addition to petitions that were signed and many letters written in support of the building, um, building's landmarking, including one from Cass Gilbert's great-granddaughter. As we look to the next half century, our hope is that these spaces are returned to the public at use and help us restore an unexpected urban majesty and its surrounding neighborhood to their rightful glory. I know that the Historic Districts Council will be with us every step of the way. I want to thank our excellent staff, my fellow board members, and most importantly, you, our wonderful supporters. Your encouragement and financial support means everything to our built environment. You are all our heroes, our mighty collective lion. Thank you, HDC. Here's to another 50. Historic preservation played a big role in helping New York recover from the downturn and the problems of the 1970s. I think preservation is poised to play a similar role as New York rebounds from COVID and all the impacts that we've been experiencing. But there are also going to be a lot of challenges ahead. And I think HDC is the group able to meet those challenges, and we're all looking forward to it doing so. I truly believe for HDC, the best is yet to come. So happy birthday, HDC. Congratulations on 50 years of making preservation history. And here's to making the next 50 years of preservation history in New York City. In preservation, I think we need to do more to educate people to recognize those things.
I mean, I think one of the great things that preservationists have done is, you know, I mean, when I was in architecture school, we all were thumbing our nose at Victorian buildings because they were so, you know, so much too much, you know. Um, and preservation said, no, no, these are really, look at them, they're really good. And I thank them every day because really there's, there is something to be learned there. And you can be smart enough to look at the right things and look for the right things. But when it comes to saying this building matters because it's beautiful and because it contributes something that connects to our architectural culture and it, it produces pleasure, it's very hard to prove. But I think HDC is doing a fantastic job, you know, and, and I think we haven't gone to, to sleep at all. Uh, but we have to sort of keep the energy going. But you're doing a good job. <laughs> and it's raining. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been a terrific event, and uh, we're really grateful that you spend your evening with us.